I wanted to welcome you all to the Washington State Library's First Tuesday webinar. It's a monthly webinar we hold on, guess what, the first Tuesday of the month. Um, so if this is new to you, you should check back and see what else we offer. So let me go through our slides. So I am your facilitator here. My name is Nona Burling. For technical support, we have Jeremy Stroud and Joe Olivar. And Jeremy and Joe, would you put your contact information into the chat? And so in case anyone has any trouble, you can um, contact either of them by phone or by email and they will help you out. So I wanted to let you know that this webinar is brought to you by the Washington State Library, which is part of the Office of Secretary of State and the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And now I want to introduce our speaker, um, Anne Glusker, who is a librarian and research and data coordinator for the Pacific Northwest region of the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, which is based at the University of Washington Health Sciences Library. That's a mouthful. <laughs> <She's>, <laughs> she also worked as a medical librarian at Group Health, which is now Kaiser Permanente Washington, and as a reference and consumer health librarian in the Business Science and Technology Department at the Seattle Public Library, and as the data request epidemiologist at Public Health for Seattle and King County. Her current interests include research data management, public health data informatics, health numeracy and literacy, and open data and data literacy. And Anne, we're going to talk after this webinar because I share some of these interests and you seem like a good person for me to learn from. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Anne and let her okay. tell you about her topic. Okay. Um, I will stop your screen sharing and hopefully this will work. Are you seeing the opening slide? I hope everybody. Yes. Yes. Excellent. So hi everyone, um, Anne here, and welcome to Safety in Numbers, Helping People with Health Numeracy Challenges, which is all of us. Um, I changed the title slightly and I'll say why in a minute, but you are in the right place if you signed up for Making Sense of the Numbers. So, oh, hold on. Okay, so here's what we're going to be doing in the next hour, maybe 45 to 50 minutes. Um, we're going to come up with a definition of health numeracy that works for our discussion. We're going to look at how it affects our health decisions and practices, um, explore how we can get ready for numeracy questions, learn some best practices, and you know, if there's one thing that we should go away with, it's a challenge for everyone, healthcare providers, each one of us, our patrons, everybody. Um, you'll also notice that my um, PowerPoint slides tend to be a bit word heavy. I know that that is not necessarily best practice, but um, I get asked for these particular slides quite often. And I just wanted that when people got the PowerPoint, and you're welcome to contact me afterwards for the PowerPoint, um, that they had all the information in the PowerPoint rather than a really cool picture, but you couldn't remember what the content was, which has happened to me. And the PS. Uh, if I can interrupt oh, real quickly. Sure. We can put the PowerPoint up with the video when I post everything. So oh, okay. It's, um, let's talk about that later. <laughs> okay. Because there's some, uh, because I work for the feds, there's accessibility issues. We'll talk. Oh, okay, after the but anyway, either Sorry. way, all of you are will have access to the PowerPoint one way or the other. We'll make sure that happens. Um, so I just want to say this little PS, which is that when I came to the National Network of Libraries of Medicine um, just over a year ago, one great thing is that the co coordinators across the nation develop courses, and you don't have to have developed a course to teach a course. So when I first taught about health numeracy. I was already very, very interested in it. Um, but there's a coordinator called Michelle Berda, and you will see her full name later, and she had developed this health numeracy course. So wherever you see MB in the slides, it's originally her content. But the reason I changed the title of this presentation is so if you ever come across her PowerPoint, you'll know that this is a different one. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Let's get to the content. Um, 
just a little bit about me. I think you'll probably guess from Nono's uh, introduction that I've gone to a lot of grad school. Um, way back in my distant past, I was a social worker with refugees. Um, many career changes later, I was an epidemiologist. I was um, working to help members of the public use and understand public health data. And so I think my health numeracy interest started then. Um, as you can also guess, as a public librarian for four years at the central location of the Seattle Public Library, um, these issues came up quite a bit. Now I'm at the NNLM. And um, I think the thing that really kind of cemented my interest was I heard a talk by Brian Zygmunt Fisher um, at a health literacy conference in Portland, Oregon. So if any of you are interested, um, it's offered by Legacy Health. It happens every March phenomenal con uh, conference and he just was on fire but anyway you'll see his name later too so now comes a few questions and just this is just just note your first reactions not e even if you don't want to pick a number just kind of like what do you think the ballpark figure is so what percent of american adults do not have the numeracy to do more than count sort and add simple numbers so have a think. Um, and even if it's 15%, that's still quite a few people to have a hard time with testing their blood sugar or figuring out dosages of medications or evaluating cancer risks and treatment. Next question, according to the New York Times, what percent of parents in one study were found to make dosing errors with liquid medications for their kids? And again, if 41% is a pretty high percentage of errors, and it's just sort of food for thought. We're going to be delving into all of this more. And then question three, what problems with healthcare access are connected to low numeracy levels? Uh, people with low numeracy levels may have more ER visits, lower levels of health screening, lower likelihood of researching treatment choices, or all of the above? Obviously, the answer is all of the above. So you can see that it really is going to have a significant impact about how people move through their life and health if their numeracy skills are, you know, contain challenges or are lower. So keep those answers in mind. Um, at this point, we're going to define health numeracy. So it's basically just do we have the capacity to deal with the numerical component of health information? Um, and you can see the kind of the written out um, definition, but I think the, the main words are understanding, quantitative, and also I want to add the ability to communicate orally. So sometimes you need multiple communication avenues for people to be able to really, really take in the information. And so we've all had the situation where the, where the healthcare provider is telling us something and they might as well just be going blah, 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 blah. Because you're sort of, you're thinking about other things as they're talking. What will this mean? When can I go back to normal activities or whatever? And so you miss the whole thing. Um, so multiple avenues of communication, I think, is part of the message of this definition. So I want to dwell on this a little bit. Um, I think these are three kind of very um, important misconceptions that I'd like to correct right now. Um, one is that health numeracy is not the same as health literacy. And so health literacy tends to focus around reading level and reading ability, and it tends to focus on written material, not exclusively, but it does focus on that a lot. Um, but it is possible to have high literacy levels, but low numeracy levels. And I think it's easy for us to imagine how that could be, but it's an important thing to remember. So if you have a very, um, what do I want to say, sophisticated seeming patron, you tend to assume that their numeracy goes along with their sophisticated verbal ability, but doesn't necessarily. Um, and we need both for health tasks in today's world. Um, it is not the same thing as being good at math. So you can be good at math, um, sort of straightforward uh, mathematical calculations, but not have the broader tasks, which include um, 
understanding risk assessment, which has to do with sort of percentages and probabilities, um, how to interpret charts and graphs, and how to communicate numerical content. And then it affects every single one of us. And I include me, and I'm a data and numbers geek, but there are times that it, the things don't click because when it's your own health information and there's the stress of that, um, it's just, it's not, it's not quite working. Um, they, there's also a lot of literature showing that healthcare workers at all levels, not just um, the, the ones with less professional education, can lack the numeracy, numeracy skill to do their own jobs. Um, and I think you've gotten the idea already that you, you can't tell by looking at someone whether they have numeracy challenges. So let's go back to those questions. Um, almost 33% of Americans don't have the numeracy to do more than count, sort, and add simple numbers. So if you imagine the prevalence of diabetes in the United States, for example, which is a very, very numerically heavy condition um, and requires people to calculate carbs, to test their blood sugar, to make decisions about um, insulin, all sorts of things. Um, if they have numeracy challenges, this can be a significant barrier to good treatment and maintaining um, healthy blood sugar. Um, in the next bullet, you can see the New York Times, it was 85% of parents were found to make dosing errors with liquid medications for their kids. So the deciding dosages piece, if you have 85% of parents and of the ones that made the errors, 68% were overdoses. So it's really something to kind of, for us to talk about and try to look for avenues to improve. Um, so uh, then I'm uh, sort of wonder, wanting us to think like what factors might contribute to these figures. Um, so some of the things that I can come up with off the top of my head, but I'd love for you to be thinking too. And if you want to enter into the chat some ideas, that's great. I'm actually not seeing the chat as I'm going through the slides, but I'll visit it later and we'll be thrilled to take your questions later. And you can always follow up with me after the webinar. But what factors contribute to these figures? Um, one is that people often get poor or misleading or um, confusing sets of directions for medication administration. I'm going to have a slide later about um, medication labeling, which is quite alarming. Um, in the New York Times study, one of the big problems was that uh, they were giving liquid medications to their children. Um, and the directions were in different units than the administration tools. So it would say, you know, give five milliliters and then the spoon was measured in teaspoons. So that's a big source of, of error. Um, and again, another one is the stress around uh, health conditions and health treatment. So move on from there, although I do have a note here to um, let you know that if you want to delve into the question of why Americans have such low numeracy in general compared to other countries, which they do, um, I found this article in the New York Times called, Why Do Americans Stink at Math? Um, and the, the short answer is that we tend not to help teachers learn to teach math. So if you want to sort of go down that rabbit hole, it's a very interesting one. So now this is like the wordiest slide ever. There's another one coming that looks like this. But what I'm wanting us to start with is to get comfortable with the content of numerical information you might need to be uh, helping a patron navigate. So what I did in this slide, um, this was actually part of a poster I presented last summer. Um, I went into the literature and I looked for what healthcare providers were being told to do to help patients, and that's on the left side. And then I translated them to what librarians should be doing to help patrons. So if you want to just look at the right side, that's the librarian side um, or library staff side. So 
I think it behooves us all to sort of just do a little bit of thinking about how to present numerical information. If you have low comfort level with that, how might you get better comfort level? What kind of resources are out there to help you uh, portray the information. There's some good stuff online about data literacy for teachers, which could definitely be applicable to us as librarians. So that's sort of the first point. Um, second point, I would, if you have, and I mean, I was a public librarian. Yeah, I had the days where I, I couldn't even <laughs> go to the bathroom. It was so busy. So I, I totally feel the, the overload of work. But if you have a chance, um, you might want to think through putting a little collection of information sources involving numerical explanations. So if you want to put together something about, say, cancer risk or um, handling diabetes or whatever questions come to your library, it could be questions about weather, it could be questions about business, any sort of numerical kind of explanations that you find yourself making often. You might want to collect some information sources about those. And there's there's going to be two slides at the end with a bunch of resources that may be helpful. Um, third idea is to use visual aids such as icon array. We're going to be looking at that in a little bit. Um, pictographs and comics. There's a huge movement now around comics and medicine and it can be a great way to sort of engage people and um, pull in the visual aspect of the emotional topics. And then the fourth point here, um, the healthcare providers were, were told that they should incorporate information intermediaries and so that these intermediaries could help them embed patient learning. In my mind, we are the intermediaries. We are the ones that communicate information. When I was at this legacy health literacy conference. It was fascinating because there was a room full of mostly healthcare providers and they were, it was a breakout session and they were all kind of bemoaning that, you know, they just, they didn't know how to get some of these concepts across and, you know, who is skilled at doing that kind of thing and who could help them and their, their patient education people were overwhelmed and stuff. And I, you know, I stood up and I said, you should, come to the library because you know your patients leave your office with your their after visit summary and they come right into the library and show it to us and start researching their condition and it was a complete shock to them and there was actually a lot of excitement at the idea of that partnership um, so pursuing it maybe is not such a bad idea um, and then finally, not on the slide, but I just want to um, exhort all of us to think of ourselves as numeracy communicators. Um, in almost any of the settings that we're in, there are some numeracy challenges and we are the sort of information communicators. And so it puts us in a natural space to be helping people with those kinds of questions. And not, as I said, not just related to health. So, um, you know, I can think of a lot of questions that came to the public library, as I said, you know, weather, business, science, even astrology sometimes had some numerical content to it. Okay, so I'm going to even dig a little deeper now into some of the, the content um, around numeracy. Here are what I think are some of the major themes that I will talk about and that I think if you want to sort of dig a little deeper yourself, you may want to look into more deeply. So absolute versus relative risk. I have to say that now that I've taught about health numeracy, this is sort of my third webinar that I'm doing. I finally can do this off the top of my head, but before that, couldn't really do it off the top of my head. I always had to sort of look it up. Um, so there's a slide. We'll talk about what those are and why it makes a difference. Second is the importance of consistent units. So we saw that in the dosage example, that you can't give instructions in milliliters and then give tools in teaspoons. Um, the same is true um, if you're giving a percentage, which is a certain number of people out of 100 experience a certain event. You don't want to try to be comparing that to another statistic that you got from somewhere else that says a certain number of people out of 1,000. If you can make the denominators the same of those fractions, and you know, here I am talking 
numerical concepts right away when you're talking about fractions and denominators. Um, you can compare like to like. A third is the outcomes for populations versus individuals. So, we're, and we're going to talk about this more too, but when a doctor or healthcare provider gives you your risk in a certain situation, that risk is based on the population. And so you understand what your chance is, but it doesn't say anything about what's going to happen to you individually. Um, and so that, the kind of uh, contrast between population and individual is something that may come in handy when you're trying to explain to someone. Like, well, my doctor said that I had a 2% chance of this outcome. So I thought that was a pretty good chance, but I got the outcome. Why do I have the outcome? And because the chance for populations is different than the chance for individuals. Um, so that's a very important thing to understand. And if, if you want to talk about this more at the end, we certainly can. Then um, here's a bullet point from Michelle, and she, uh, it's called, it's about graphicacy. And I thought, did she make that word up? But she did not make that word up. So graphicacy is the ability to understand information that is sort of numerical information that's visually presented. Um, I really like it because I think it's such an important adjunct to numeracy. So when you, you know, even recently with the stock market, you're seeing lots and lots of charts and they're all labeled differently and the axis is, axes are labeled differently and the point that the graph presenter is trying to make is different. So, so interpreting all those things really is a part of, of our life these days. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to, um, it's not really numeracy, but I can't help myself. Um, I just wanted to call out the difference between data and statistics if you see those two forms kind of flying around. Uh, basically data is what you're going to see in an Excel spreadsheet. So it's, it's the raw information and the statistics is more the analyzed and aggregated form. So I just call it like raw versus cooked carrots. It's kind of the same thing. Um, so you're, so either of these is probably okay as a search strategy, but you might want to focus more on statistics because you will naturally get the digested or cooked data. Okay, so here we go. This is kind of, I'd say, the crux of communication. And it, it, it tells, it, this slide will show you how challenging it is to carefully and methodically present numeracy information and how confusing it can be for the patient or patron that's having to navigate it. So, and let's call the blood pressure medication Valentine um, because it's almost Valentine's Day. So basically the population level of stroke risk is two out of a thousand. And that's an absolute risk. So if out of, if there's a number on, t on the top of the fraction and there's a number on the bottom of the fraction. So out of a thousand people who don't take Valentine, um, there will be two people that have a stroke. But if for some reason your physician has decided to prescribe you Valentine, that will increase your chance of a stroke by 50%. That is a relative risk. So it's relative to your two out of a thousand chance, what is your chance when you're taking Valentine? Um, and you can see right now how alarming that is. 50% chance of a stroke. No, it is not a 50% chance of a stroke. It's a 50% increase in your chance. And that's why you should almost never use relative risk because it's, it doesn't get at how the phenomenon is likely to affect you as an individual. So what that translates to is the 50% increase in risk, 50% of two is one. And so your risk has gone from two out of a thousand to three out of a thousand. And by the way, this is something that advertisers use a lot. So um, if they're, they're advertising a certain medication and they say, you know, our, their medication, Valentine, 
gives you a 50% increase in having a stroke and ours gives you only a 45%. And that sounds pretty good. Oh, I gained 5% five, 5 there. But when you look at the absolute risks, it's almost no difference. Um, so the, the total risk of taking Valentine is a three out of a thousand chance of having a stroke. And you can, it's just so much easier to interpret that. Um, and so then you get to ask the questions like, should I take it or should I not take it? Is this an acceptable risk for lowering my blood pressure? What are the risks of high blood pressure? Well, one of the significant risks of high blood pressure is stroke. So you want to take that into account too. Um, and okay, so and this slide, I'm just going to stop for a moment. This slide is what's kind of hard about doing a webinar because I wish I was in a room with all of you and I could see your faces and know whether this is coming across well, but um, I'm going to move on and happy to revisit this either in today's webinar or personally later if, it, if you have ideas about it or questions. So we talked in the previous slide about um, how to help people understand risk. Again, here's a slide from Michelle. Um, and there are kind of, um, what do I want to say? The word is manipulative, but I'm, I was looking for a better word, but it's not coming. So there are kind of manipulative ways to understand um, the impact of risk. And I've actually seen um, some things in the health literacy literature where they're suggesting to health care providers that they can actually steer patients one way or the other based on how they frame the risk. They steer them towards what they think they should be doing. Um, I mean, one, <laughs> I, okay, let's, I'll, I'll say it. It's a weird personal example, but um, I had a dentist once that wanted to do an implant and I was, I went to see the person he wanted me to see and the person said, oh, well, we're going to have to use cadaver bone. So I looked into cadaver bone and I thought, I'm just not comfortable with it. It's, it's nothing terrible about it, but I'm not comfortable. I think I'm going to get a bridge. And he was so offended. He said, did you understand my information? I said, yeah, I understood, but I'm making a different choice. So even if you frame things perfectly, people might not make the choice you think. But here's a slide about framing. Um, 2% of people who undergo this procedure develop a serious blood infection. Really not so helpful because um, it's a little hard to figure out such a small number and what does that, I mean, if it's really serious, then maybe I should be worried even about that small number. Um, option two, 98% of people who undergo this procedure don't develop a blood infection. Well, a non-percentage is also a little difficult to interpret. Um, so best is, two out of 100 get a blood infection, and 98 out of 100 do not. So any of these is okay, but you might want to aim at something like option three. Um, but you always want to be accompanying with visuals if you can. And there's no excuse not to because there's this fantastic tool developed by Brian Zygmunt Fisher, who I talked about before and who we'll talk about later, called Icon Array. It is such an easy visual aid. And so you just go to iconarray.com. I hope you'll all try it afterwards. And you literally, in this slide shot, you just type in 32. And that's the array that you get. So it does, you don't even have to be doing, um, the percentages don't even have to be people. You could have percent of the stock market or percent of cloudy days. I live in Seattle. Um, there's also, you can do any kind of percentages and have this little grid. Um, but you, you can see that it's, you almost don't even need to understand the number to understand the phenomenon. So Icon Array is a fantastic and powerful tool. There's also a clinician version, which lets the clinicians put in more than one set of percentages if they're helping people compare risks between one or the other option. So I really highly commend this to you. Another thing to think about in helping people um, understand risk using visual aids are infographics. Now, I, there's great and then not so great infographics. So you want to be sure to 
uh, vet it first. You want it to come from a reputable source. This one's from the CDC. Um, but as you can show here, they've actually done some numeracy information work here. So that one out of three at the beginning is shown because really the that circle that says 86 million, that really doesn't really have the same impact as, as when you see those three people and one of them has it out of three people. In that case, you're imagining yourself in a room with two other people and one of you probably has it. So that's pretty powerful. Um, the nine out of 10 people with prediabetes don't know they have it. That's also very powerful and that looks just like icon array. So they've also done some numeracy there. Um, then they have some sort of non-numerical content. But the one I kind of like is that bottom right one about that says half because it's it's actually sort of numerical. They, they're cutting it in half, halfway through the word. So there's all sorts of ways that you can play with visuals. Okay, the challenges of labels. So I really, really, really went into a rabbit hole here and it was so interesting. So if you find yourself fascinated by this as I did, um, go for it. So you can see that in a classic prescription label, which is on the left, it's just such a welter of pieces of information that are small and are, that don't stand out in a helpful way. Um, it takes literacy and numeracy and I'm not sure even what else. Um, I still have to look for my pharmacy's phone number like, where is it again? Where is it again? And if you happen to get things from more than one pharmacy, the labels are slightly different. So it's, it's really um, not surprising that patient errors in reading labels can cause up to 700,000 serious incidents yearly. I mean, that's really not acceptable. Um, so, you know, high percentage, 38th percent of people with at least a 10th grade reading level made a mistake. I'm saying it's not it's not just about reading level, which is true. There's also language and culture issues. People are in pain. People are stressed out. Um, but the design is a big deal. And so what you're seeing on the right-hand side is what Target did. And Target actually had a graphic designer. She did it as part of her thesis at NYU, radically redesigned the prescription label. Um, and patients loved it and you it's visually you can just see the powerful impact right at look by looking at this slide so target had this kind of bottle from about 2005 to 2016 and then CVS bought them bought the pharmacy part of target um, and they went back to the old label because they didn't want to try to standardize all their pharmacies and the patient outcry was enormous and people were there's a newspaper article I read that people were digging their old target bottles out of the trash to help them figure out how to understand the CVS bottle um, so CVS apparently is now releasing in 2018 with that same designer a more user-friendly bottle we'll see what happens um, but just the idea that that design can help people with numeracy um, I think is a powerful idea. And like I said, there's some really, really cool stuff to read about it. So deep breath. Hopefully we're, we're all still with this. Um, so now I'm going to move into some best practices for actually communicating numeracy information. And I have the site at the bottom there and it's, it's a great uh, resource if you're interested. So one big thing is to not make them do the work of figuring out the math. Um, so where possible, you want to do the math for them. Um, and on the right are listed the possibilities for doing that. So providing fewer options. So I don't know if you've ever heard of the tyranny of choice, where people just sort of look like stunned deer in the headlights when they're given sort of 10 options. If it's possible to provide fewer options, that's always great. Provide less information, so counterintuitive, but 
you know, and a lot of this is judgment too. There's a lot of people that will come in and say, I don't want less information. I want all the information you have and I want article after article and that's how I'm going to process this diagnosis. Great, great. But if you get a sense of overwhelm, you know, be sensitive to the person that you're standing across from. And if you get a sense of overwhelm, you might want to just back up a little bit and realize that although we are information providers, what we really want is the information to get through to them and providing too much or at the wrong level or in the wrong way gets in the way of our goal. Um, okay, so present absolute risks, not just relative risks. Hopefully I've made a pretty strong point about that. Um, keep denominators and time spans constant. So we've talked about that as well. Um, and measurement is not mentioned here, but that's another one. Um, Use numbers that are consistent with how people use the number line. So if you imagine that number line on your desk in elementary school, if you're old enough like me to have done that, um, you can actually realize that sometimes when we're talking in very, um, what am I trying to say, like divorce, ways that are divorced from reality, just kind of like esoteric, philosophical ways, no, with this information, you want to get really concrete. You want to sort of, I mean, sometimes people gesture with their hands, you know, like a risk of 5% versus a risk of 75%. I'm doing kind of a visual with my hands that looks like a number line. That kind of thing is what they mean. Um, doing the math for them and using appropriate visuals. We've talked about that as well. And more. So I'm going to talk a little more in depth about this one. So you want to provide evaluative meaning. So there's one thing is doing the math for them, but you may have done the math for them and it's still not completely clear what the, the meaning of the math is. So what is the difference between 5 and 75% in this context? Um, so the first one is carefully use evaluative labels and symbols. And I actually, when I was preparing to give this talk, was like, I, I guessed completely wrong about what that meant. Um, what they mean by that is you would say to someone, um, a 5% chance is actually an excellent chance and a 75% chance is a pretty poor chance. Now see, I don't completely agree with this. Um, it works in some situations, but you know, just, to the person you're talking to, they might feel like 75% chance of the, of the bad outcome. They're willing to accept it because they feel like they're in the 25%. There's all sorts of ways people think about these things. But if there's some concrete, reliable um, evaluation of what are poor, fair, good, and excellent outcomes, those words will help people more than just the numbers. So that's what this means. Um, Carefully use frequency versus percentage. So this is interesting. There's research that if people have numeracy challenges, the frequency is stronger. So if you're saying one in 10 people uh, will get hit by a car tomorrow. No, <laughs> that's not true. But one in 10 people is a, is a stronger way to express something than 10% because percent can be a very hazy uh, category for people. There, it's just sort of, what does that mean? How, how many is percent out of? Like people don't even always get that it's out of 100. So one in 10, they can visualize those 10 people and what, how many one is. That's why icon array is so powerful. So try not to use percentage if you can avoid it. Um, Use more imaginable data formats. So when I was preparing, again, I looked at this and was like, what's an imaginable data format? I didn't really know what it meant. So um, I looked that up a little bit. And what they mean is um, it's, they did some studies where they were talking to people about their disease risk. And if you give someone a, a percentage risk of a certain outcome, again, it's a very vague thing. Whereas if you say to them, it's likely that you will lose this many years or this many months of your life if you do not have this treatment. That is very, very imaginable compared to a percentage risk. So wherever you can translate risk into something that's more concrete, like years or months of life lost, 
Another really good example of this is um, in restaurants next to a menu item, they, they, they did studies about, you know, so there's all these menu items, there's, you know, I'm thinking of dicks, like hamburger, it, this is if you live in Seattle, hamburgers, shakes, fries, whatever. You put the calories next to it, and those are just numbers. But if you have a little walking person and you have how many minutes of walking it would take to burn off that menu item, that's very imaginable. And it's also very motivating. So that's another example of creative thinking around what might sort of get into someone's brain to, to make the information real to them versus just numbers flying around in the air. And then finally, use emotion to persuade. Um, Cigarette warnings are a big uh, example of this. So where the, the ones where we've heard in Europe where, where you know, it's the, the horrible people with their teeth rotting out, um, apparently those are effective. I, I mean, there's varying literature on it, but that would be an example of using emotion to persuade someone. There's a big movement now about um, storytelling in science and this would be kind of an area where you'd want to explore that. Okay, so here are two examples and I think that it's really obvious how much better the second example is and it's not condescending. I think one thing that I'm a little fearful of is that I'm that you think that I'm suggesting that you dumb down things and I don't think any of this is necessary um, to dumb down things. You can still be sort of respectful of intelligence, but communicate in clearer ways. So if I were sitting in a chair and my uh, provider said to me, well, Ms. Fisher, your systolic blood pressure is 150 and your diastolic is 95, you have primary hypertension, um, you can cut your heart disease risk in half by 50 or by 50 percent or in half if you quit smoking. What about 25 milligrams of beta blockers once a day? Um, I, you know, I would just be sitting there stunned, like, well, I'm still back on systolic blood pressure. What is systolic blood pressure? It, it didn't help me to have that much information. Um, so, Mr. Fisher, your blood pressure is high, or Ms. Fisher, it's me they're talking to. Um, so, and hopefully you have a visual aid that sort of shows the different points of blood pressure and what's high, and you could point on that chart where the person's blood pressure sits. Um, if you quit smoking, you can cut your risk of heart disease in half. Here are ways that we might be able to help you do that because notice you're sort of inserting the options into the discussion of the condition. Also very helpful. So you're giving the information, along the, the options along with the information and you're giving the person a chance to kind of incorporate each section of the message. So there's three messages, high blood pressure, benefits of quitting smoking, and medication. So that's, each one of those is a pretty big message. And so to take a little break in the middle can be helpful to the person also. Um, and then decision aid for deciding about medications. Okay, another wordy slide coming. So here's the rest of my poster from last summer. Um, the things that we talked about already related to the content of the numerical information. This slide is about the techniques. So again, the way it was set up before, the left-hand column were um, suggestions in the health literacy literature, health and also health numeracy, for healthcare providers. And on the right-hand column are those suggestions translated for librarians. So, the providers are being told to set up systems to assist their consumers. In libraries, you should assume that if someone's coming in with health information that they need help with, they probably have not got enough time with their, their provider, no fault of the provider. The providers have other intense pressures on them, completely aware of that. But, um, and we have time pressures on us too as librarians, but often we can give the patron more time and a little space to kind of incorporate reactions and information needs. Um, providers are being told to assess patient numeracy. I would say to librarians, we're not in a position to assess, we should just should never assume. Um, use coaching and teachback techniques. I'm going to talk about teachback in a minute and what that is and how to do it. Um, engage patients in their own care. For us librarians, 
we, I think we know this instinctively, our patrons may not feel that they can handle the numeracy requirements of some of the material they've been given or some of the information they need. So that's where we have to sort of get creative and look for things like visual aids, look for more imaginable data formats, that kind of thing. So it's, and, and again, this can be anybody, you would be surprised um, who has numeracy challenges. Um, so, and, second to the bottom bullet on the provider side, explain the meaning of the numbers given. Um, we talked about evaluating percentages that the evaluative content piece, we should really not be doing that unless we find something in the literature that does that for us. So it may look to you like 5% or 75% go in a particular direction. It's probably best to send those kinds of questions back to the person's provider unless you can find really solid information supporting it. Um, and a lot of the time it's a personal decision and we'll talk about that later too. Um, and then tailor your communications to the patient and for us, that's realize that patrons decide on courses of action based on many factors. So that dentist should not have been mad at me that I didn't want an implant the minute I heard cadaver bone, <laughs> to use a icky example. Um, okay, so teach back, what is teach back? And again, this is like super wordy slide because I wanted you to have all the information about it. But the first thing is that you're explaining things clearly. So you've got your ducks in a row in terms of the, the numeracy information being communicated clearly, without jargon, that kind of thing. And then your goal is to see how well you explained it. So it's not like, did you understand me? What is your knowledge? But it's like, did I get my idea across? So you are trying to encourage the patient to teach back to you what you just taught them. Um, you ask open-ended questions, so you don't want yes or no answers. You can actually ask patients, and in this case patrons, to show you how to do something, like check their blood pressure if they're having to do it. Um, and again, the onus is on us, and in communicating with the patient or patron, we're saying, I want to make sure that I got this across to you. Oh, I see. You skipped that step in checking your blood pressure. I did not mention it. My bad. Let's go back. Um, and through teach back, you actually can find that you left that thing out. Um, how to do it? Slow speech, eye contact, genuine interest, relaxed body language. We all do this already. That's why our patrons come to us as librarians. So yay us. Um, and then again, for, this is kind of a more provider focused slide, but um, use teach back whenever you explain an important concept. Um, participation in clinical trial, yikes. Um, and then you, you check for meaning that's a very important and complicated concept um, and check for comprehension. And by the way, I'm realizing, I don't know why it occurred to me on this slide, um, but I didn't mention that the reason I picked the bottles for my left hand side of the slides, partly because I like them, but um, just to remind us about issues with dosages as we go through and how numeracy can really affect so many sort of daily activity things around our health. Okay, so here's another sort of best practices slide. So we're giving all this information to our patrons, but as we're going, and I think we do this again naturally already, we want to be sure that we help our users evaluate health information in future because they're not always going to be seeing us. They're going to be, you know, at home on the internet or whatever looking for their information. So as you're working through a question with a patron, be sure to narrate your process. What are you thinking? Why are you going to this site rather than that site? Most of us do this already. Um, you might want to ask them where else they looked and what they thought of that information. It'll give you a clue to their thinking of how they're getting their health information. Um, there, I think people um, have this feeling that they're not supposed to take stuff from the internet to their provider. The provider may say, oh, well, you know, I've, I've been doing this clinically for 20 years and I don't know, but it, you know, it's okay if you find something to ask your provider to respond to it. Um, there's a really good guide to evaluating health information. And then this might be a really good 
avenue for uh, collaboration with providers and organizations in your area. And then a slide about respecting your patrons' decisions around their health, even if they seem mysterious. So this is Brian Zygmunt Fisher, sort of my health numeracy hero. Um, in 1999, and then there's a picture of him now, obviously his gamble paid off. Um, he was given, he had a blood condition and he was given these options. No treatment would give him 10 years to live and treatment would give him a 70% chance of a normal life, but either a normal life or a 25 to 30% chance of death within one year. Wow. So he was 28, he was married, he had a child on the way. He thought, and this is a guy that developed icon array. I mean, he is all about sort of numerical thinking around health information. But he just thought, I don't want the first 10 years of my daughter's life to be seeing me sick in hospitals and not know me as a real person. I'm going to gamble and take that chance. And so he did. And for him, it worked out. But he said he was on a, a unit um, where four of the people did not make it from this treatment. So, I mean, it was quite a gamble that he took. So, again, this is another one of those points where the individual versus the population level, the risk versus what's going to happen to you as an individual is kind of an unanswerable question and people just have to try to sit with it and, and move forward, I guess. I don't envy that choice that he made. Um, and then... If, let's say it was one of us that was given that choice. Um, we, as librarians, and again, this is from Michelle, we as librarians would be wanting to, to really, really delve in and figure things out. So um, she put survival statistics here. That would be um, a certain treatment. You know, it has risks in the first year, but what happens beyond that? Um, do you believe what the numbers are saying? If the numbers seem outlandish, uh, is there a story behind them? What is that story? You might be looking for research studies or clinical trials. Um, clinical trials are where, um, and it's generally sort of a randomized trial where a particular drug or intervention is being studied in a systematic way. So usually, you know, you have 100 people and randomly 50 are assigned to one intervention and 50 are assigned to the up to, well, the other or no intervention. Um, so it's kind of a very, very exacting way to get a, a strong result. Um, you want to explore different types of research. And then who is behind the numbers is a huge question. Is it pharma? Um, watch out if it is, and I'm not saying that their research is bad, but you want to know that they're the ones sponsoring it. Did they test only certain genders and races, etc. Okay, and like many webinar presenters, I see that the time is getting a little tight, so although we can go past 10 a.m., I'm going to move forward a little more quickly. I'm pretty much done most of the core content. Um, and here's another slide from Michelle, just to remember that there may be no answer especially with things like new diseases. Back in the day, it was like this when HIV first made its appearance on the international stage. The questions that people really wanted answered could not yet be answered because we didn't have enough experience with that phenomenon. So if you look at what we know about Zika and what we don't know about Zika, the things that we really want to know are the things we can't know yet. Um, and I, you, I'm sure you've all had questions where people are like, they would be saying right now in January, okay, I want the 2017 data on births in Washington State. Well, it can take a year to get all of that together and cleaned up, ready to release to the public. You might be able to get an estimate, but that's a data example, but this is a disease condition example. So not always an answer for things. And then two slides of resources. Um, I have checked all the links, so they should all work just fine. Um, if you want to delve into this, and you can tell I'm really passionate about it and think it's fascinating stuff, 
these resources are great. So I love every single one that Michelle has listed here. Um, and again, happy to get the PowerPoint to you. And then my list is a little bit different. I, of course, think Brian Sigman Fisher, how many times have I said his name in this webinar is awesome. Um, and you might want to look at his personal health journey. Helen Osborne is another one. Health Literacy Out Loud podcasts are really great. I also like um, sometimes the UK health information. I like their plain language very much. It's, it's sort of, um, they do a really good job of, of being straightforward and yet somehow a little more formal and respectful. I don't, I don't know. Um, you might want to have your own opinion about that, but there's a, something to check out. Um, and then this workshop summary, it's huge, but it's, it's where I've gotten a lot of the material from this talk. And then the Minnesota Health Literacy Partnership is another great thing to look at. So we're at the point of questions. Um, and I will move to the next slide so that you all have my contact information if you want to write to me. So, so thank yeah. you so much for coming and, and questions. And this is Nono. And Hi, we Nono. definitely have had some questions coming in. Okay. Um, one that referred specifically to your slide about the New York Times study where 85% of parents have right. dosing errors. And someone right. said, can you tell us the date and citation for that study? I didn't see it on your list of resources at the end. If no. You, if you can send me that citation when we send out a link to the oh, okay, um, sure. recording, I'll add that in. Sure. Um, the next question came when the the picture of the prescription bottle from Target was up. Oh, and yeah. Someone said, do the, and I, you, you may have answered this. It says, do the labels still look like this now that CVS bought Target Pharmacy? Have, yeah, you, so you, what happened was at first they didn't because CVS was sort of faced with, oh my God, Target has these awesome, awesome labels, but our, the Target pharmacies are maybe what, you know, one third or something of our total pharmacies now. And they didn't want the effort of bringing all those two thirds of their pharmacies in line with what Target was doing. So they went back to the old labels for everybody. Um, but according to what I've read in 2018, they are going to release new labels that are even better than the target labels so that they used the same woman that designed the target labels and they said okay we cvs give up everybody wants better labels can you help us and she had all these ideas that she didn't get to do with the target labels that she's going to implement one is that for example they're going to have um mechanisms where people that are on multiple medications can get printed out schedules like what they should do daily and weekly and that combines all their medications they have all these ideas um so be just watch this space i guess can i uh add something in there real quick sure um we actually use target pharmacy ourselves and i know that the the labels that we get look really similar to the target ones on there even after the cvs buyout um so i'm wondering if maybe oh, good. they allowed some targets to keep the old labels uh in the meantime you know it could be i'm i don't use either one and so I was going by what I read about it but I could easily see that it might be a little inconsistent yeah. so another comment and I think you actually answered this and it's someone commented that even though the target one is better there's still room for improvement absolutely um, why would you use QTY for quantity when there's plenty of room to spell it out and it sounds right. like they're going to be addressing that right right uh, um, we had a question that says how would you convert risk two years loss? I, it's, I, I mean, I'd have to sort of, that is a super, super intense philosophical question um, in general, but my immediate answer is you would not. So it's not actually um, a directly convertible thing, but if it's something like smoke, so I believe that the slide said use more imaginable data where possible, but if it didn't say that it should have said that um, because it might not be possible. You might not be able to find an expression of the risk in years lost, but for things like smoking and diabetes that are well studied, you can find it. So you would, it's, there's actually epidemiological calculations that you can do where you start people off with an expected 
amount of healthy years of life. And then you look at smokers and you see the, the years of life that they have. Um, and then you would look at people who quit smoking after 20 years of smoking, you'd see the expected healthy life that they have. It's all kind of population level calculations. Um, so for well-known conditions, well-studied conditions, you actually can find both pieces of information, but it's not a direct calculation. I'm sorry if I was misleading about that. Okay. Um, you had a great comment from Brittany who says, I have to admit I was so nervous when I saw numeracy, but this has been incredible and eye-opening. Oh, a, that's good. We have a wellness initiative this year, and I'm so excited to take this information to my department to consider when we're choosing information this year. Awesome. I, I foresee this changing our reference services in health and wellness for the better. Thank you so much. Would love to get this PowerPoint so I can view those hyperlinks in your resources. And then Terry has found which, librarians. She's found the uh, resource of the New York Times article that oh, someone great. requested and yeah. added the link to the great. chat. But we'll again send it out with the recording. And then Anna, that was all the questions from the attendees, but Okay. I have, I have a question oh, myself, yeah. which is, and I suspect, just as a guess, that the vari that the the large number of people watching this webinar are possibly medical librarians themselves. But for someone like me who is not a medical librarian and who I think of myself as relatively good with numbers, but I think that this would be kind of overwhelming to me and I'm yeah. not sure I would feel comfortable being that intermediary right. in terms of, of trying to interpret it. I wouldn't want to give false information and I just wonder what you have to say about that for you know perhaps the, the public librarians who aren't buried in medical information. All right. Along. Um, okay so the first thing is that if you're not feeling comfortable we, we've, we've all had to sort of take stabs at bodies of information that we weren't that comfortable with to sort of get a patron started. Um, but I just think being honest about like, okay, this is not something that I have a lot of background in. Um, with the health stuff, certainly say things like, um, I'm concerned that I might not be the best person to ask about this, but I'm going to find you the best person. So you sort of take it as far as you can comfortably, push your boundaries a little bit, but the idea is to get the best information to the patron. And so if that means connecting with someone else, it means connecting with someone else. That's, um, a, that's a good response. Okay. Yeah. Um, that was all the questions that came in via chat. I'm, um, I did forget to say at the very beginning of the presentation that when you close down your window, there will be a survey that pops up that we need to gather statistics for our own reporting. If it's just four quick questions and if when you close it down, if you're willing to and have the time to take it, we would really appreciate it. Um, and I want to thank you, Anne. This has been really fascinating. Oh, good. I think I think it's pretty cool stuff. So. And I'm going to talk to you more about data because data is kind of my my fascination at the moment too. So we, we'll be hearing from me. That'll offline. be fun. That'll be very so, fun. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks everyone.